Hello again, this is Franz Cantor here at the Australian Cartoon Museum. I'm a caricaturist and a tune talker and a cartoonist and a speaker and a teacher and a Tinker Taylor spy and all of the above. Um, I'm here with uh, Jim Bridges, who is the... Um, were you? He's the president of the Australian Cartoon Museum. Right. So the subject that we've chosen today actually comes from my daughter, um, this is a, a character that I've kind of grown up with. Hopefully you've grown up with him too. Um, this is Sid James. And uh, he looks very, uh, looks like a koala bear there, doesn't he? Very, um, he's got these koala bear ears, which are these big tufts. Mm. Um, very iconic face. So um, I've done a little sketch. But this isn't the photograph that I'm working from. I'm working from something like this, which I'll show you a better shot of it there. So that's a, it's a good photo. A good, nice publicity oh. shot, shot. Lots it's of got um, a lot of light and yeah. side lights. So um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. What else have we got? He had. Um, this is him with his second wife. He I had think, very I curly hair. Yeah. Oh. And uh, he had this iconic s smile. Yeah, well, uh, 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 the sort of very, um, very memorable uh, face and very memorable laugh. Um, he's got lots of very interesting lines that we can try to capture. Yeah. So let's. He looks like Mr. Melrose. Looks like Mr. Melrose. Mm. Well, there's not a lot of. They're, they're, I mean, there are a lot of lines there, but uh, well, they're, they're kind that's of what structured. most people have memory, of, you know, me memories of him with a, a very he heavily lined face. Yeah, and the little kinky hair. Yeah. Sort of very fine ringlets of hair. Well, tiny curls. Tiny curls yeah. of hair, yeah. The ones you can't iron out, you know? Yeah, so I've done a little, uh, just a little exploration in from the thumbnail into the, uh, the pencil stage on the toned paper. So what we're looking for here is um, basically you've got a big head and you've got these cheeks that are very very muscular there's a lot of muscles on his face there's a lot of expression a lot of smiling going on so yeah a lot of it, he's a very active person um, great sense of humor but also has a serious side so there's a lot of conflicting uh, broken lines in his forehead um, his eyes are look very weary and and um, squinting you know but that just means that he's uh, he's really been looking <laughs> he's uh, been doing a lot of looking so um, what am I trying to say here the basic structure is going to be this sort of like a, a guitar inverted guitar shape so you're looking at this and this right so the lighting's coming down from the top left, or the left side actually, which means that you're going to favor shadows on the left hand side. So the, the lighting's coming in from the right, so the shadows are gonna form on the left. Makes sense, right? And, and the then top, you're able to the get- And the top, it's coming in from the top too. Yeah, well there's, a, there's another, like a, a, it's a classic portrait light. Yeah. There's a He's film. literally got a Hitler mustache under his nose with that shadow, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's try to get some accuracy in these um, squiggles here that we've got to work from. I've put some glasses on so I can see what I'm doing. Um, oh, that's not too bad. I can see a little bit better now. Uh, so let's start with the eyes, I think. We kind of get those mischievous eyes in there. What's going on here? That doesn't look... So I think Prismacolor have got it out for me. Um, I've been trying to. Uh, I've been tr see. I've been trying to use Prismacolor terracotta, and um, I haven't been banging the pencils or anything like that. It must have been like pre pre broken. Um, because they're just like a loose tooth. 
Okay, let's try again. You're not going to do the, the T zone? All right, what Jim's referring to is this uh, area of concentration, which is the mouth, the nose, and the eyes, right? It forms a sort of a pattern, which is a s kind of like a T. So all of those individual elements you have to focus on. And really, that's where the recognition factor is going to be paramount. That's where it's going to be found in the relationship between these elements. So the elements themselves don't have to be um, in the same proportions as you see in the, re in the photograph. That's the idea of caricature, is to ex exaggerate proportions. Uh, and also, in, in many respects, to simplify. By simplifying it, first of all, into a basic shape like I did with a guitar shape, right? You've got the idea of, of uh, changing, sh changing proportions and scales as, as you go and then trying to zero in and get the details within the new confines, within the new shapes that you're um, articulating. So that's, that's what the whole process of uh, caricature is. It's trying to, you know, at the same time, I must say, you're trying to entertain yourself here. This isn't a uh, democracy. It's not, you know, um, if, uh, what was I going to say? The concept of a likeness is not, we're not, it's not the paramount, it's not the most important element of uh, the caricature. There's also a, a visual narrative that you're telling with the drawing itself. So, you know, important thing, um, under these circumstances, I don't like rushing, so don't rush, right? Because when you take your time, things occur to you on the fly that if you were to rush, you know, you probably, because there's a few things about the, eye, the eyelashes here, which I don't want to rush to. Um, things will occur to you and will make it a better picture. Then how come some cartoonists say that they do their best work uh, with deadlines? Uh, well, deadlines are a good... They're, like, deadlines are a factor in the, you know, the production process. So the that you're actually... The commercial world. Well, right? I have a deadline here, right? I want to finish this within an hour if I can. Um, so that's my deadline, okay? So within the structure, I have the ability to slow down and speed up. Let's try to get some more relevance in those eyebrows. I'm afraid I've lost the, uh, the plot a little bit. So, sorry. There's a bit of shape in the hairs themselves that we want to try to capture. Um, before we move around the face, I want to try to get the eyes in alignment because that's going to be important. So just continue on and match the size for size, left and right. Usually it's a good practice to do, unless there's some reason why you don't, you know, which is uh, to do with dynamics, like a cartoon exaggeration or something, you know. As a, as a child of the 50s, I grew up with uh, Sid. Did you? Well, I mean, he was always on our screens. Yeah. And we had a early television set, which had lots of movies. Um, and Sid seemed to me like, I mean, most of the people I used to know as a child were drinkers. Yeah. And he looked like... A the drinker. Sort, the sort of, yeah, he definitely looked like a drinker, although he swore off it, apparently. Yeah. Um, he had a heart attack, early heart attack, and he swore off it. He only had two drinks a day, apparently. Yeah. But um, he looked like... Everybody had a um, a version of him in their their own family as a, some sort of uncle, you know. Yeah. And always cracking. Always having a bet. Yeah, having a bet. Going to um, the betting shop. Cracking jokes that kids didn't understand, and sort of um, pinching uh, your mum's bottom and all that sort of stuff. Um, he, really? Well, okay. yeah. He, they, you know, these these uncles, you know. Okay. Anyway, um, so I always thought he was like a, a very avuncular sort of character. But um, uh, the American film industry have lots. Of, they they produce a lot more films than the British film industry, and they have a lot more character actors. Yeah. So he became like to me 
their main character actor. He goes, in England? Yeah, he'd turn up in as a taxi driver yeah. or a copper or a bad guy or yeah. a con man. Or in, in, um, in one film, he's a snake charmer in a, in a circus in Trapeze, I think it was. All right. And he was, you was talking about it, he was a, um, a journalist asking cheeky questions in Quartermass. Quartermass 2, yeah. Yeah, Quartermass. 2, the second film, yeah. Yeah. And so he was like the man on the street. Yeah. And he'd crack these jokes and... And often uh, he would be called Sid in the part. Yeah, uh, uh, that's right. Um, yeah, he was always called Sid. And that was his name. So... You, you sort of didn't feel like he was playing a role. He was just being, being himself. Him. Yeah. But that's in television shows and in movies, you know. Yeah. And, of course, he did a lot of fourth wall stuff in the, um, in the, um, in the, ca- in the Carry On series. Yeah, so it's speaking to the yeah. camera. Yeah. Like, uh, mm-hmm. And looking at the camera. So usually with innuendos, yeah. you know, they would look at the camera. Definitely like to, innuendos. To share the... Yeah. Um, to share the, uh, it, the, the, and as I grew up, I, I found him gag. It, as I as I grew up, I found him irritating. Yeah. But okay. um, and then when I got through that stage, I liked him. Mm. But I remember just sitting there looking at, uh, if if he's on the screen for a long shot, I just look at all the lines on his face. He just seemed to have more lines on his face than any other um, person in in British uh, films. I didn't ask my daughter why. Uh, I should paint him. I think she's very interested in the lines because there's a lot of lines here. Yeah. As you can probably tell, you know. I'm, yeah, Mr. Melways. Yeah, there's a lot of lines. Mm. So I think she's, uh, you know, thinking it would be a, a good um, caricature for that reason. And it's true. There's, there's um, you know, that does make an interesting project. So that's... Um, it's a challenge, isn't it, to try to and keep even up in with serious the, films they stick these, him in as um, this roadmap. As, as a joke, uh, uh, you know, as, as light, light um, relief. Yeah. Um, lots of films, um, and of course he was on television and radio a lot. He was called Sid Rumpo. Yeah. On the radio, and he played um, uh, this is movie. These British made these Western, and he's walking around. He's this bad gunslinger wearing black clothes. Oh, it was a Carry On film. Yeah, yeah. And everybody else is talking in American accents, and he didn't. He's talking no. in his Cockney, except he wasn't Cockney because he grew up in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Everybody he grew up he was... in South Africa. Yeah. He, oh, he okay. Was... I didn't know that. I thought he he was born in South Africa. Well, he was born like, there, and he didn't... And he was born in 1913, hmm. and he didn't come over to England until 46. Right. You know? He was in the South um, African Army during the war. Right. Yeah. And um, you know what he trained as? He said all sorts of things what, in his biography and that, but basically he trained as a hairdresser. Oh, OK, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because he has this uh, he has this incredible hair. It's <laughs> so somewhere between yeah. sheep's wool and uh, yeah, and human hair. I'm pretty sure. I, I remember looking at it thinking, I wonder what would happen if you ironed that because he had this sort of um, steel wool like hair. Mm. I, mm. That's what I used to think. And um, in the in the acting trade in England, they called him. Um, he was a natural at acting natural. Yeah, which is, uh, you know, great when you want to have, you know, a yeah, level of connection with the character. Yeah. Um, so he's, as you said, you know, that uncle or somebody that you can relate to in the part, you know, which just makes it a little bit uh, easier to absorb the, um, or easier to follow the movie. Yeah, he's in lots of films. Um, he, was, um, he was in a Chaplin film, The King of New York. Um, he was um, actually they asked him to play Fagin in the film Oliver. Oh, okay. But he got sick of playing bad guys and criminals, so he mm. decided not to do it. But I can't imagine because yeah, that's a singing role, isn't it? You're talking about yeah, the musical. Yeah, um, it's the... a singing role. Um, and the guy who played him, what's his name? I can't remember. Who Alec was... Guinness. No, no, that's in the movie. Oh, okay. But well, in the, in the musical, the guy was fantastic. 
Yeah. But you see, he's a name. Everybody knows him. He's a name. Everybody knew who Sid Jones was, you know? Yeah. Whether you know much about British cinema or not, he's just... Because he was on television too, and of course television just is huge, you know, for people for the recogn uh, recognition factor. Yeah, so the, what was the TV show he was in for, f for uh, six years, I think? Oh, Bless This House? Or? Yeah, Bless This House, he was in Two in Clover, hmm. um, Citizen and the Jones. Hancock Half Hour. Yeah, Hancock's Half Hour. Um, yeah. He was in that for about five years, and yeah. he also did that on radio. I remember listening to him on radio. He had a very distinctive voice. Um, you could be in another part of the house, and if you heard his voice, you'd know there's a British TV on or, 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 or a movie on TV. You know? Yeah. He died at 62 years of age, and yeah. he died on... Well, he had a heart attack on stage. Yeah. And... Um, He's grabbed his chest and all that sort of stuff, and people just thought he was messing about. And um, they were just laughing because they thought he was just doing it deliberately. What a great way to go out. Well, Hancock went out the same way, didn't he? He, he, he uh, had a heart attack and fell off the stage. I think oh in dear. Sydney. He was doing a stand-up. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so, I mean, he played crooks and taxi drivers and truckies and barmen and, and both sides of the bar. Yeah. The snake charmer, as I said, in trapeze, um, but mostly a lovable rogue. Yeah. Like a lovable rogue, but he was a con artist, you know. And he made 19 carry on films. Yep. I think there are about 40 carry on films made, but he, he was in 19 of them, and 17 of them he had. Um, Major roles. Well, he had the, the starring role, yeah. he had the, the name at the top. But Colonel Rough Diamond. <laughs> uh, I don't think the carry-on films are in the class of the goons, but yeah, and and the two films he he didn't get star billing was because um, Frankie Howard was in them. Yeah, yeah, and he was a gambler. Yeah, and his third wife, he had a deal with his <coughs> agent um, that his wife wasn't to know how much money he was earning. Yeah, because a lot of it went into gambling. Yeah. Pay off his debts. Yeah, and of course he never made any money. Uh, he was just no, a, you don't. a total loser at gambling. Yeah, and yeah. but he but um, you know smoked a lot. Yeah. So he didn't. Uh, he d he had um, a propensity to uh, have a heart attack. He didn't really. I think. Well, uh, he had an early heart smoked. attack, and then he, he he swore off the booze with two drinks a day. He'd have one meal a day. Yeah. Um, and he, I think he stopped smoking, although I don't know, in the films he seems to be smoking all the time, doesn't he? But, you know, he, he, he was the British man on the street, the iconic man on the street. Mm. He'd always come back with a, like someone asked him a question. You have a wisecrack. Yeah, yeah, always, you know. Yeah, and it'll always be an innuendo, like a, yeah. something to do with... Yeah, he, he just reminded me of a, of, a, of a naughty uncle, you know, a cheeky uncle. Yeah, so in the carry-on, all of the men, other than, you know, Hawtree and um, um, uh, Ken Kenneth... Williams. Williams. Yeah. He had, uh, had that incredible voice. Yeah. Um, so they're all, in, in the carry-on films, all the men were very, you know, they were womanizers. They, they would, uh, if a girl bent over in the street, they'd be right there. Yeah. Looking up her... Looking up her dress, looking up her <laughs> phone number. Um, you be careful when you start a sentence. You've yeah, got to finish no. it very quickly. Looking up, looking up, looking timing, up phone number. Timing's not that good, man. So um, yeah, I don't have his timing. But the um, uh, what was the, what I was going to say was he was a woman. He was the one life. that you actually believe that you know that he actually meant it. When oh, those little remarks, those little side remarks. Oh yeah, he was just you, really. You just a felt face like he wasn't. He wasn't following bawdy. the script. He just said what he wanted to say. That's what you got the impression. Yeah, or even the script was made for him. Yeah, you know, like yeah. they. It was written with his reactions involved in in mind. Yeah, um, and I'm sure that was the case uh, with uh, a lot of it because, you know, he was the, he, he he was the star of many of the shows. And um, everything kind of hinged on his story, his arc, 
his story arc in the uh, picture. Yeah, well, let's go for his films. He was in um, Follow That Camel with... Um, Phil Silvers. Phil Silvers. Yeah. He was in uh, Lavender Hill Mob with... Um, yep. Uh, with what? Who was in that? Um, Obi Ben Kenobi. Alec Guinness. That's right. Yeah. And Herbert Lom. That's right. And using the Titfield Thunderbolt, which is about a train. Right. Um, he was in early, um, the early uh, 50s version of Robin Hood. Yeah. Riding yeah. through the Glen. Robin yeah, Hood. Yeah, that's um, not, not uh, Richard Todd. That's um, Richard Green. Richard Green, yeah. He was in a film called The 39 Steps, which is a remake of Hitchcock's film. Why they would make a remake of that fantastic That's film, the Kenneth I don't Graham, know. the Kenneth... Kenneth, Kenneth Graham is Kenneth, the bloke who yeah. wrote um, Wind in the Willows. Yeah, no, another Kenneth. Yeah, what's his name, guy? I can't get him But I don't know why they remade it, because it's a great story, but, I mean, why do it after Hitchcock? Because that's still one of his best films, I reckon. Yeah. I watch it every year, that film. Huh. He was in his Cheryl Lee playing a, um, uh, a, a character on the road. Look at these beautiful um, He was in... Mo I was Monty's double, but he certainly wasn't Monty's double. No. I don't oh. remember him in that. But. Yeah. Um, lots of films. Lots and lots of films. Um, and he's... Uh, you know, we've, we've done his TV shows. Mm. And he was a bit of a... Um, a womanizer. Um, yeah. He got divorced. He got married three times, and the first time he got divorced because of his um, his philandering. Yeah. And apparently, his second wife, um, which was, was a uh, a daughter of a high falutin um, uh, South African uh, politician or some person of great. And um, he. Uh, he he had to leave the, you know, the story is he had oh, to leave okay. the country. He had to leave the country, but he always wanted to. Yeah, he he was set up by his wife's uh, father in a hairdresser shop. Right. Had his own hairdresser shop, but he wanted to be an actor, and he joined the South African um, repertory company or something. Mm. Yep, you've got him. It's a beautiful you've face. Got he's got. I say it's a treat to to do this. It's a lot of uh, line work, a lot of drawing. It's probably going to be over the, over the hour mark. For this you can movie. actually see him dressed up as a as a hairdresser, can't you? Yeah. In, in a white um, apron. And well, I had barbers who had this sort of hair. Yeah. Um, growing up as a kid. And yeah. um, it must have been hell for you because you hate barbers. I don't dislike barbers. You touch my hair, I, I break dislike your Dislike hairdressers. Oh, hairdressers. Yeah. Ah. I don't like being touched. Because they fuss around your hair, you know, and it's like, no. Well, not today. They get just, off. They just cut it all off. Get out of it. You know, and leave it with a He ball. would say, get out of it. Give me that scissors. Yeah, yeah and um, he, he was a, a philanderer, and apparently when he was doing the, the carry-on films, he had an affair with Barbara Windsor, who was the, the small, busty blonde in the series. Yeah. In most of the films. Yeah. And... Um, Apparently, according to Barbara's book, the tell-all book, mm. um, they had an affair that lasted 10 years. Yeah. And uh, she was married to some, I don't know, a wrestler or some guy. All right. I can't remember. But... Um, You're not mixing her up with... with um, Diana Dawes. No, um, Jane Mansfield. That's a different country. Oh, Okay. That's a different country, it's America. Anyway, um, he came home one... The story goes, he came home one day and there was an axe through his front door. Right. And another time he came home and all the furniture in his house had been rearranged. Right. Which was a subtle hint that, you know... That you can rearrange your face. Subtly space. rearrange you as well. Right. And... That'd be interesting, the furniture's rearranged so that... No. Well, did he do the vacuuming? It scared the daylights he... out of you, wouldn't it? If he came home and hang well, on. Not, maybe he did the vacuuming. Maybe he had sort of <laughs> no. I don't think they made did it that. look they better. Just, they just moved it around. They probably left some more subtle hints around the place, you know. Yeah, tore the head off his budgie or something. No, that that happens in America. Do they have budgies in England? Yeah, Australian. They have budgerigars. Yeah. Oh, budgies are Australian. Yeah, I know. 
and budgie smugglers definitely Australian are Australian and they yeah. smuggle budgies they certainly do yeah. that's what they're for yeah so um, do you want to discuss the um, the ramifications of why he has lines on his face and where they are well the lines in his face are very um, he's a very um, this is um, Franz Campo, our, our resident um, facial archaeologist here and, and mm. geologist. Geologist. Yeah, geologist. I think you're a gee whizologist, actually, but that's mm. another story. So um, the thing with lines are lines, cre lines are created by thoughts and emotions that play from the mind. They play over the face because this is how we communicate. We communicate with our facial expressions and our hands, you know. So when you learn to draw, that's the two things most people find hard to draw, are hands and faces, because we're so used to reading uh, our faces and hands and the poses and expressions that they make that um, they're, they're very, um, they're very, we're very critical of uh, anything that is, um, that smacks of um, symbolism or um, you know shortcuts so yeah um disney disney was no good at drawing hands walt disney yeah he was no good at drawing hands he only drew four fingers <laughs> actually the four finger glove was because animators it wasn't because animators couldn't draw four fingers or didn't want to draw four fingers he's going to get a prop let's continue on So, as I started with the eyes, with the to with the brown pencil, I'm going to be. Walt, would you get out of here? I'm oh, sorry. With the black pencil, so you know, areas of focus, as I said to you before, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. This is where we're going to work. This is our play pen, right? Mm. And um, if you feel like exaggerating a line or a wrinkle or something you should always try to explore it because as I said to you before the the way that people read faces and read expressions we're very very ad adept at this and um, micro expressions which are slight little wrinkles or slight little differences in the face are very sharply read by humans by people and apparently by dogs now. So dogs, because they've been living with us for millions of years, for 20 million years or whatever, um, they are now used to our micro-expressions. So I notice you don't mention cats in that uh, dialogue. I'm not sure if cats are the same, uh, been living with us for that length of time. But, um, you know, certainly uh, cat owners experience that uh, level of, Connectivity with your with their with their cat, definitely. You know, um, they just have a different, a they, different they take lack, on it. They lack empathy, unlike dogs. Ooh, that'll, that'll uh, I don't know about. That'll, I, look, that'll I, cause a bit of trouble. Look, I don't know about that. That's probably an overstatement. I think because pe pets live with humans, they kind of take on. Their traits, yeah. Well, not not so much the traits, but sort of behavioural um, elements, behavioural patterns that are part of the part of the new the new pack. So we become a pack. We're the leader of the pack. The dad is the leader of the fa the father is the leader of the pack in the house or the or something. And you know the animals would conform or would be uh, aware of that and would comply. Yeah, except the cat regards himself as, as the leader of the pack in families. Well, again, you know, there, there's, there's a level of um, anthropomorphic um, um, fantasy in attaching too much uh, significance to behaviour of um, animals. Um, we, the truth is we're not sure. We just don't know. Um, you know, animal behaviourists are... Um, even confused by a lot of the behaviour of animals. So well, they're finding out more and more um, 
it seems to me that there's um, every 18 months there's a big breakthrough in what they understand about animals. Yeah, there are things that that, that fascinate us. If you go onto Reddit or something, and you know, you you'll see films of bumblebees being uh, affectionate to their human pet, their human owner, you know, or or. Not so much snakes, reptiles, I don't think, but uh, birds, chickens, goats, sheep, cows. Keep drawing. Keep drawing. Longhorn cattle. Longhorn cattle. Long. Yeah, you'd think longhorn cattle. Well, you wouldn't get anywhere near Come me with those longhorns. Come over here and scratch my back. Yeah. Yeah, but they're you know gentle and um, and uh, affectionate. So um, so it's a shame we have to eat them. But, you you, you know, sometimes don't be delicious. I think is the. <laughs> The the, um, the moral of the story, don't be delicious. Yes, that's some moral. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, most caricaturists, when they're drawing Sid James, mm. would add so many worry lines on his head. Well, you'd call them worry lines. They're, they're, well, they're activity that happens from the brain. Yeah, but I mean, I'm saying that you're a caricaturist, or, mm. although you claim to be more of a illustrator than the characters. Is that yeah. why you're not adding extra lines up there? Well, the, the, I'm only adding the lines that are appropriate. That's what I'm saying, but the characters to add a lot more. Maybe. Well, they tend to. Yeah. You're it stick, depends on you're what, sticking what the, to the script. Aim. You're sticking to the script here. Well, the, the script is a beautiful written story. There's a lovely story in this face. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, he and, looked like um, he could play a fisherman or something, doesn't he? You know, he's got a... that. That weather-beaten face of his. Yeah. Maybe that that that's why he was so popular. It may not even be weather-beaten, you know. It may just be his skin. Yeah, but he looks not affected. He by just the looks weather. like he's worked out in the weather. He looks yeah, like he's been, he's could been, could been be out in the racetrack squinting at the <laughs> race forms. That's what it looks like. Yeah, he's been out out and about, you know. So there's a lot of conflicting um, lines in his thoughts, spend thought a bit patterns. Of, spend a bit of time at the racetrack too. Of, yes. There's a lot of these. You see these, the crinkles up here? Yeah. I mean, there's crinkles in his hair. There's crinkles everywhere. Um, but um, these deep furrows in his head, in his, in his forehead, um, they happen when he's happy. When he's unhappy, and you can see that in some of the parts where he's angry or something, the lines completely disappear, or nearly so that's just an example of an expression that's led by a, a, a wrinkle or a line that's led by an expression. The expression comes from thoughts. So when you're angry, you well, feelings and thoughts. Mm. You're having angry thoughts. He preferred working in movies to TV. Mm. Um, and apparently he got a house built um, that was within walking distance of the Pinewood Studios. Yes. So... He could go home for lunch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when they when they broke for lunch at the studios. Yep. Yep. And apparently he designed most of his house personally. All right. I wonder if he cut his own hair. A lot of barbers cut their own hair. Do they? Do yeah. They, how do they get round the back? I don't know. Um, well, I I once knocked on the door to go to the barbers and he wasn't ready. And he, he brought me in, he told me to sit down and shut up. And he was cutting his own hair. And I remember watching him thinking, gosh, that's hard. that'd be hard. Mm. I used to love going to the barbers because they had all these magazines with all these cartoons, the Australasian posts, and and they had men's magazines with, with uh, great cartoons in them. And they used to make you feel like a big kid, uh, a big bloke, because they'd... Yeah, they'd, men's um, magazines. They'd put you on a, a you you were too small for the ordinary seat, so they'd put you on a on a booster seat. N well, it was just a board that you sat oh, on. Oh, was it? That went on the arms. You must have been really little. The armrest, yeah, and I don't really and they'd crack that. all these jokes. I'm sure that. Say, how's been... your love life and all that sort of stuff? And you're just a kid, you know. Yeah, I didn't do that with my mother in tow. She would have uh, <laughs> taken me out. Um, 
She didn't I remember like he said, how's your love life? I said, it's fantastic. I didn't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And all the blokes laughed. I looked around. I said, don't move your head. Oh, I'm sorry. You know. Yeah. I always find it incredibly um, stupid. To, uh, at the end, the whole experience, they hold up this mirror to see the back of your head. It's like as if that made any impression on you whatsoever because you never, ever see the back of your head except at the barber, you know? No well, one... I don't and you know don't even that. care. You're standing in queue at the post office and you see the back of your head all How do the you time see? with the security cameras. <laughs> well, I never look at security cameras. But the... Um, well, they're looking at you, but... Yeah. I mean, no, I didn't, I just I didn't find know it I had really a ball... Stupid. I didn't know I had a ball spot at the back until I was standing in the queue one day and I thought, who's that bloke? Who's that, that was me. That was you. Yeah. Ah. Um, that must have been a shock if you hadn't... See what I mean? You never see the back of your head. So yeah. if you didn't see the back of your head, you wouldn't have known and you wouldn't have been shocked. So I think it's a ridiculous thing to have um, hairdressers hold up mirrors to see the back of your head. It's like, who's that goomer? I don't know who that hell, the hell that person is. I don't recognise the back of my head, sorry. Are you trying to show me that uh, you didn't get up to any shenanigans back there and and put um, Kilroy was here on, or or just shave it all off? Mm. It's like try to make you feel. Um, see, I didn't do such a bad job. You know, I only wrecked the front. See how good the back is. So you can come back again. Well, Take some, a chance on me. Some actually give you the side view. The side view. Yeah. Some, I never had not that. Not all of them, but some do. I yeah. never had that. Yeah. And I also find it funny that in the early days, you go to a barber shop and they got these 1950s haircuts up on the wall and pictures, you know. Yeah, everybody looked and they, like they're mandrake. All and if they're colour, they're all faded, they're all blue. Yeah, yeah. Because the sun yes. bleaches out all of the flesh tones. <clears throat> and they had those little glass cabinets with all that stuff that looks like it's um, stuff they use for torturing people. Yeah. All those little tools in there, you know. Yeah, the shaving bits, and, clipper heads yeah, and... Strange-looking um, curly things. Curly things? Yeah, the curling hair and all that. These. Oh, these are hairdressers. Yeah. These aren't barbers. Yeah, yeah hairdressers are... There's an Australian um, an Australian uh, painter called John Brack. Yeah. Who, who's very funny, actually. He's, yes. He's a very funny artist. And he got obsessed with all those things, so he... Paint all the objects in a barber's shop right. in a window. And he also did uh, false legs and, um, you know, things like that. You, as paintings, as subjects? As paintings, yeah, as subjects, yeah. yeah. He was a very funny artist. Um, actually, we should make a film about John Brack one day because yeah. um, when he got older, the, the, the funny thing about his work is where things connected. Like, he'd have two, three, four objects thrown on the table. And where their lines connected, because something's on top of each other, they're not separated. Yeah, overlap. Mm. Where, they, uh, where they overlapped, there was somehow funny. It was somehow funny that he made some sort of humorous junction. Right. And um, later on... A strange he did these really. He did these paintings of pencils, coloured pencils, the war between the, the red pencils and the blue pencils. Right. And there were thousands of them. And he'd draw each one methodically, you know? Oh. And when you actually see the originals, it's just amazing the, the, the amount of time you must have spent doing it. But they're all like a big surfing, big surf uh, wave of red pencils coming down to attack the, the, the blue pencils. Right. And there'd be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pencils. So where the, are these now? These are in the gallery? or? Yeah, they're, they're, I think they're the latest the stuff. National gallery. They're some of the last Victoria. works he was doing before he died. Mm. Yeah, I love the National Gallery here. It's much better than Sydney's one because, um, you know, Sydney's always been unfinished. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Look at these freezers out there. All the they got nearly all the um, well, turtles. Well, the reason the National Gallery of Victoria Raphael, is so good is because they set up the Felton Bequest. Yes. Many years ago, and they ended up with um, a lot of money. 
they ended up with a lot of uh, being able to buy a lot of paintings. Yeah, they didn't buy blue poles though. That was uh, no, that was um, James Mollison, wasn't it? Bought mm. that. Um, he rang up. That was a good uh, little. Um, yeah, two point three, and within about ten years, was worth seventeen million. Mm. Interesting man, um, old uh, Jackson Pollock. Yeah. The film's not bad. I haven't seen the film. The film's not bad. Was he in a film? Yeah, oh, it's a, it's a, no, it's, um, it's... You're not saying a biopic? A biopic, yeah. No, it, I don't like biopics. It's, it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, most art films about artists are terrible, mm -hmm. as you know. Mm -hmm. And they always try and give you the secret of art. The, right. Like the fast-forward version of what art is and how you produce it. Right. This miraculous mystery that only artists know. Je ne sais quoi. But it um, mostly never works. I've hardly ever seen any films that actually produce that. Well, there is a film called Bigger Splash by, oh, about David Hockney. Mm. which was um, made as a semi, semi-biography. Mm. Um, but Is he playing himself? He plays himself, yeah. It's a very well, that's good not film. a biopic. No, it's a, as I said, it's a semi... It's a dramatised docker. He thought it was going to be a docker, but it was a bit more. Yeah, it's just some semi -dramatic. He wasn't happy with it, but I think it's one of the best films I've seen about art ever. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to give him any um, leucoflexes or...? No. Well, I'm going to bring some light in from over there, but uh, mm. I'm just sort of see I've made room for it with these holes, sort of these lines. It always amazes me how much, how much uh, information you get into their eyes when they're drawn so small. Well, it's the pencil, see. I know, but they're, Pencil's a lot they're not more even a quarter of an inch, and yet you've got so much mm. meaning there. So I use pencil the way a lot of artists would use a pen or a brush. Is so that your I, animation yeah. background or your no. illustration background? Illustration. Yeah. Um, because I have to work... I like to work fast, and I like to build up the confidence of the picture so having the um, the ability to slowly build up this uh, thick and thin approach to the lines slowly building up rather than committing too early um, just means there's a safety net um, in the process you don't if you make an error you can easily real, you know rub it out whereas with a brush if you're doing like a colour illustration, you've got to paint it out and then paint it back in, and you know it becomes like a bigger, a bigger problem. Also, these pencils are waterproof, so kudos to that. You know that's how most of my illustrations were watercolour, um, right over the top. So, you, so your tears don't interfere with the drawing. My, my what? Your tears. Tears. They're waterproof. Tears. Um, yeah, well, I didn't have tears, so I didn't bother, bother with waterproof. Well, not waterproof. But, um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to... You know, it's, it, it, this is a new process for me, I must say. Talking and drawing at the same time is not a natural thing. I think you do a lot of artists. I think you do a Somebody bloody... pointed out to me, I can't do that. Yeah, I can't talk I know. and draw at the same time. Yeah. It's nerve wracking. You know, you can't get lost. I think you do lost. a good job because I stir the hell out of you and you, and you take it out. Only occasionally do you stop drawing. You stop drawing. So, um, Sid James is, um, or was, uh, uh, you know, I loved his uh, films. I shouldn't have. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that's, I mean it's so corny but um, you know the, the gags, the jokes that he used to make um, well, they, they were so corny Can when's I the last time you saw brushes? a carry on movie? Uh, a couple of weeks ago I would have seen uh, I'm, uh, this is another thing that's funny about me, I quite like the black and white 
films. The early yes, stuff. so do I, yeah. I loved the uh, Carry On Cabbie, you know, and he was uh, he was the star of that. And uh, with uh, Hattie Jacks, I think, was the... Uh, was the uh, George his, played, the played head, his wife the head nurse or someone always yeah um, but he was always Sid you yeah know, he was like Sid um, so again it was I mean know, how many actors like how many actors got to play themselves in a way you know what I mean um, yeah they just sort of he was just like an institution wasn't he in in the in the film industry in England I know? think that's why a lot of people liked him uh, because. You know, he had that that uh, personality that you can always rely on, you can always trust. There's going to be innuendo, there's going to be stuff, you know, in the jokes themselves you may not get or um, whatever, but you just um, admired his um, his personality and, uh, you know, even the sexist uh, humour, the whistling. Not, he never whistled, but, you know, he would sort of be aware of... Uh, of uh, Dolly Birds or whatever. So um, it's kind of like, I guess it's in a way as a male, you kind of like are aware of that attraction but are not willing to commit to it um, in any crude fashion. You allow him to do it. So you stand back and let him go, the, ah, 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 you know, make the, the jokes or whatever and uh, things like that. And you know, it's sort of like a. Um, so he he stand he's a stand-in for us. He's the everyman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he is. Um, he's he's um, the man on the street, the dirty old uncle, all that stuff. Yeah, I'm not saying we're dirty. I'm just saying that uh, you know because he 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 will react. He will react to a girl in in a mini skirt or mm. a low cut blouse or something. You know, he will react. Um, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of like. Um, well, he's you know, sort of. That, you see, he, he's South South American, but he's sort of. It's a male. It's, it's like he's just come out of uh, vaudeville. It's you yeah. Know what I mean, it's like he was just born in vaudeville and just came out of it, and that's, and 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 that sort of made his character. Yeah, it's a male um, eccentricity yeah. of uh, a lot of you know. Even if they're not um, overtly uh, sexual or, or uh, anything, they're, they're, you know, it's probably under the surface. Otherwise, why would um, pinups work or filthy French postcards or um, indeed, um, you know, carry on films? Well, I haven't seen a carry on film for must be 30 years. Really? Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, they were... I think the only you one... You had enough of them, or what, well, what's, yeah, what's the deal? Yeah, they're not my cup of tea, but I think the one I do remember is... Um, is it um, um, Up Pompeii or something? With... Um, Ron ha R um, Frankie Howard. Yeah, Frankie Howard. Um, well, that's not a carry-on film. Carry-ons were with that regular cast. I thought it was carry-on up... Um, Pompeii. Yeah. Oh well. Anyway, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, we, I mean, when I was a kid, they were everywhere. They were just everywhere, you know, at the pictures, at uh, on TV. I think they even had. A they would do send-ups, like uh, Carry On Cleo came out after yeah. Cleopatra. Yeah. So Cleopatra was that movie with um, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. And uh, they brought one out uh, a year later, or a couple of years later, perhaps. But it would be referring to that film. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you'd have Julius Caesar, I think. Um, he played Julius Caesar, I think. Did he? Yeah. He may have played a different character. I'm I think his sure. name was Julius Caesar. I think Kenneth um, uh, oh, he Williams was well, the, One of them played Mark Anthony. Yeah, well, he would have played Julius Caesar because there's a line in it, infamy, infamy, they've all got infamy. So it was like... Um, you know, the, I mean, the jokes that sound ridiculously inane and corny, you mm. know, coming out of my mouth the way they do. But in the film, everything was sort of exaggerated like a pantomime. So, mm. um, well, you, you know, see, these things actually did, worked within the context of the in, film. In your lifetime, did your mum actually take to a pantomime? 
On stage? No, I didn't even know in Australia we had pantomimes. Oh, they had some, yeah, but we never saw any. I never went to the theatre until I was in my, um, in my early know. 20s. Uh, my mother took me to things like um, the Tin uh, Oh, the puppet thing, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, the horrible, creepy um, Norman Lindsay um, thing. Oh, the magic, magic pudding. Ugh. Oh, God. You're, um, you're travelling on a lot of um, people's childhood here. If, you, if your childhood features the magic pudding, then you're in trouble. Because that is a definite uh, creep, creep fest. That's like then the... How come they haven't made a horror movie of it? I'm sure they'll get around to it. Oh, okay, they'll get around to it. You're an expert on horror movies? Yeah, no, it's a horrible... Fancy having a, a kid's book. The guy must be joking, you know. It was he was written on a bet apparently, like you know, a bitch you could do a kid's book. Yeah, and it he was, did, yeah. and he wrote the magic pudding. Yeah. And everyone says, Oh, it's an Australian classic. It's creepy. It's horrible. You know, you well, he, there's, Alice there's in Wonderland runs around exactly, getting you to eat him. Al Alice in Wonderland is not exactly pristine. No, there's a creepy thing about Alice in Wonderland too. Yeah. Um the more you study these things, the more you kind of like get uh, goosebumps. On how, how the hell did they allow these things to go through back then? Are you going to do any little, little even white, wiry things in his hair? Yeah. Like you did with uh, Danny the other day? Mm. That was good. So, um, yeah, we should do uh, Alice in Wonderland. That's a creepy... Uh, it's a very creepy book. I've got, I'm working on three films on it, actually. Mm. At the moment, we'll put them up one day. The Tenniel uh, experience. Well, I mean, if you're a, if you're a, a book illustrator, mm. that's like climbing Everest. Is it? Yeah, that's, that's what everybody wants to do. That, that's the, how many people have done that? Yeah, All the top people have done that. Steadman. Mind you, um, I, I'd say that um, the original um, Disney film, Tenniel and um, Lewis Carroll, uh, you know, um, mm. cohabitation was one of the best. Well, it was really designed wonderfully. Like, for instance, if you hold it, held up the page of when she goes through the looking glass right. to light on the, as you, the the reverse of her coming through the other side. Is actually on the. It, it's all printed perfectly together, so you hold the page like it's a piece of glass. You know. All oh, right, I didn't know that. Yeah. Is this and also all, all editions? also when they mentioned certain phrases, he had little sp spot yellows, not the complete page. Yeah. And they're exactly at the side of what was written, so. He, he deliberately did all that sort of stuff, you know, so to mar marry the image with the picture, you know. Right. The, the, the image with the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of... Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, the magic pudding, very, you know, beautifully illustrated, but uh, just the subject matter is creepy as... Um, so yeah. a lot of innuendo in uh, a Sid's penguin work. with pants on. Mm. A penguin with pants on. It, yeah. Mm. His pants come up to his uh, chin practically. Mm. I think it's something to do with the era as well, because it was yeah. a very creepy era. Um, depression, mm. or is it earlier? It'd probably be earlier. Yeah. It was very creepy. Love what you're done with the chin. Very creepy. So he's got that little elephant uh, kneecap uh, happening yeah. in his chin. To strength. Let's try to get uh, well, you get kicked when you baby. You didn't really get kicked um, in the head by an elephant. He didn't really push his nose much, did you? You just flatten it a bit. Yeah. Because you tend to do big well, it's noses. It's a light caricature. It's not a. People tell me that you're a big nose artist. Uh, okay. So. Um, just trying to get a little bit of shine in here. There's a lot of uh, different textures. 
in his face and um, you know shiny areas and things which are beautiful picking up the the light and showing off a lot of the um, character um, this is like a, a character rather than a caricature it's a character chur <laughs> something like that a caricature character chur that's what it is um, so he's got a really do you know what the word caricature means uh, character maybe I haven't actually looked it's that Italian up. I remember right and it means yes it roughly means the loaded line loaded line yes so you you charge the line mm. with extra Ink. whether well thickness or thick and thin yeah I, I think of it as life force myself life force yeah especially great characters just got life force right yeah well they just speak don't they they tell stories so yeah this is the you know like I prefer your picture to the photo and it's a great photo it's got all sorts of information in that photo but um, you're only picking um, well you're picking probably about 80 percent of the features in that face and you're extending some and um, you're highlighting a lot of things yeah So, um, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, this is picking out, you know, areas, of po possible areas of, of modeling and shine individually, you know, it's mm. good fun. Um, it's got a lot of little shiny bits on it. You might use a different uh, brush for that. Actually, before that, I might just help out the, the contrast of the shirt a little bit so it'll stand out from the background um, yeah so this is a another one that was a Posca brush pen this is a Posca marker and uh, it's getting all of these little tiny little pubic hair effects on the on the hair itself there's a tiny little curls that are kind of cool mm. little tight things that don't do what they're told yeah yeah I remember looking at his hair a lot when he was in close ups and stuff he seemed to have hair you could never control well especially in the 70s you know he just let the yeah, just uh, let side it. levers yeah. grow Yeah. or if he didn't have side levers he had these great big um Father, dear father, Tufts. Yes. We had a prime minister that had that. He, he it was um, what was his name? After Holt, um, after Harold Holt, prime minister. Yeah, I'm just trying to think who had oh, these God. little tufts. McMahon. Oh, wing nuts. Yeah. So he had these little tufts. You know, well, this they was that the, little. They were big. They were big. Yeah, he had these side tufts yeah, that sort he of had, he had, ballooned um, out. Sideburns that wouldn't go down. Yeah. You could probably nail them down, but that's about it. They're always going yeah, up. Yeah, Patrick Cargill effect. Yes, Father. Patrick, yes, yes. Um, that, that's another thing about British um, um, actors. They mm. seem to have all more hair than American actors, you know? They just seem to have less haircuts or something. I don't know what it was. They just seem to have a lot more hair. Right. I, I never would have thought about that. Okay. What do you mean from the, the same period in the 70s? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, um, also, Even in, Dirty in real Harry life, had long, I, I, I knew a lot hair. of um, English people who came out in the, the Ten Pan Poms. I met a lot of those. Yeah. And um, I remember asking, why don't you get your hair cut? And this is before the Beatles even, you know? Right. And they said, well, what's wrong with it? I always have my hair like this. And I was yeah. okay, you know? It's, I just noticed, that's one of the details I noticed about English people. They seem to have a lot more hair um, before well, they you, get haircuts. Yeah, we well, kind of learn, I guess... Uh, I mean, you have suave guys like um, Dirk Bogart, but it just seems to me there's so many actors who have a lot of hair. Yeah, but the 70s, you sort of, you know, they all grew longer hair. Well, I'm talking 50s and 60s. Oh, no, then, you yeah. know, that, the rocker era, they would definitely have had haircuts. 
they would have had more more volume at the top mm. you know like the uh, Elvis effect well all those clean cut the rockabilly all those clean cut guys from America they they stopped cutting their hair that's for sure because of the um, the mop tops from Britain we love the Beatles, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't remember anyone in America doing that other than Glenn Campbell or someone like that. Oh, Glenn Campbell never had long hair? He had a mop to, he had a... Um, oh, no, but I'm talking about long hair. Top. I'm talking about letting your hair down to go from crew cut... Oh, like Gandalf or something? No, they go, well, there was a lot of um, American bands who grew their hair long. Lots of them. Yeah. Still. Yeah. But it all started in the 60s. Did and it? it started from England. Right. Wasn't that after the Beatles went to India? That type of thing? They came back with beards and long hair? Well, when they first... I mean, they were called the mop tops. Yeah, well, that was... And I didn't think the hair was that the, long, personally. But the Americans carried on like they had really long hair because Americans had very short hair. Right. Mm. Ah, well, you did sit well. You did him. Yeah, I've lost a little bit of line work um, here and there, but uh, I think it's. Uh, I'm going to try and maybe get some of it back with this uh, thing. Sorry for taking. When you say I lost a bit of line time work, time in the world to do it. A little bit of the thick and thin oh, yeah. thing that I've built up with a pencil, but that's okay. You know, I don't want to do the whole thing in pen, but in a brush um, so you know the brush pen the brush this brush is really cool for this uh, thick and thin approach mm -hmm. and just to kick things out a bit you know so um, well, yeah, I love, I love the little, little highlights I wasn't quite sure I'd get his uh, like likeness the little but I kind of like here. yeah I wasn't sure I'd get his uh, likeness today. Because no, I wasn't, I wasn't sure either. It didn't look like you were going to get it, but then bingo, very quickly you got it. I think it all came in when you got the other eye done. Yeah. Aye, aye. There he is. Mm. This is uh, Sid James. This is the before Sid James. And um, let's try to get a... Uh, that was Sid James. It's Billy. Another subject. No, that's not a very good one. This is with his second wife, I think. Valerie, third wife, maybe. There, that's what I mean by the um, the sort of uh, you know uh, teddy bear look that the mm. koala bear is. Mm. The and tough the 70s. Sort of grow the wild. 70s, yeah. yeah, in the seventies. Yeah. And this is from the, like the fifties. Yeah, the fifties. Yeah. Now this is from probably from the fifties as well. So yeah, that's uh, Sid James, and this is Sid James, and this is Franz Cantor, and I'm here with... Jim Bridges, and, and we'll see you on the flip side. On the flip side. Bye-bye.